Okay, so this will be our first video. Keep in mind that uh, if it's written down, it is most definitely important. If it is said, it is also important. You cannot go with just what is written down. Okay, so today's video is going to focus on cells and the definition of life. Remember, these are your notes for this topic. There will not be a lecture in class over this topic. This is your lecture that you need to be taking notes over. Okay, so a little bit of review first for middle school. We're going to start with um, biotic versus abiotic. Most of you guys hopefully know, remember what this means. Remember, biotic are uh, factors in the environment that are living. Abiotic would be factors in the environment that are non-living. So some examples of biotic factors uh, would be things like animals, uh, plants, and trees are plants. A, um, bacteria, fungus, all of those things would be an example of biotic factors. A, where your abiotic factors, these would be things like the soil, uh, the rocks, water is a non-living, air, a, those would all be things that are non-living. And those two things are going to work hand in hand for survival of the species. This is biology class. We are going to focus on the characteristics of living things. And so all living things have a few things in common, whether it's a bacterial cell versus a human, it doesn't matter. Okay? And so one of the first things that they all have in common is that they are all made of cells. Okay? Cells are the smallest unit of living things. They're the, the smallest thing that can be considered living. A bacterial cell is a living organism. A, it's a different kind of cell than what we have in our bodies and what are in plants, a, but they are still living. When you break the cell down into its parts, a lot of you know about a nucleus or a cell membrane, those things are not living. So the cell is the smallest unit of living things. So all living things have to be made up of cells. A, they also all have to be able to do metabolism. A, metabolism is not just um, the breakdown of food. Okay, uh, metabolism is both the breakdown and the build up of materials. Okay, metabolism is going to be a result of chemical reactions. Uh, anytime you see those two lines with the arrow there, okay, that is result of. Okay, so metabolism is going to be a result of chemical reactions. And like I said, it consists of two parts, both the breakdown and the build up. So the build up portion is called anabolism. Uh, it is also called synthesis, okay? and that is the building up of materials. The easiest way to think about that usually is within our body. Okay? Um, for example, if you're exercising a lot and you're building up muscle, that would be anabolic. Okay? You're synthesizing uh, new muscle there. As you're growing and your um, bones are elongating, okay? that would be anabolic. You're building up uh, bone there. When we build proteins to do our everyday life, okay, that's anabolic. Okay, the other, the flip side of that would be what is called catabolic. And so catabolic would be the decomposition or the breakdown of materials. Uh, digestion, you know, we take that food in and we break it into the smaller parts that it's made of. Okay, um, what you can see uh, here. In this reaction here, you can see these glucose molecules coming in and being synthesized into um, glycogen, so that would be anabolic, where if they went this direction and were broken down, that would be um, catabolic reactions. Okay, all living things also need to have the ability to reproduce. Okay, so up here we've got lots of different um, cells here, as those cells were able to reproduce. All living things also must contain DNA. They have to have a set of instructions. Nobody said that set of instructions had to be in the nucleus. They just have to have one. Okay? If you remember, uh, your DNA is a double-stranded helix shape. Okay? DNA is made up of what are called nucleotides. We're going to hit this a lot over the course of the year. Very important that you remember what a nucleotide is. So a nucleotide is a little piece of DNA. We put a whole bunch of these nucleotides together. You can see there's a whole bunch of them here together. And that's going to make our big, long strand of DNA. OK, 
Okay, each nucleotide contains three parts. It's going to contain a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. Remember your A's, T's, C's, and G's? Those are your nitrogen bases. And so this over here is a nucleotide, okay? That phosphate, sugar, and nitrogen base. And the DNA is going to carry the information right here down the middle with these nitrogen bases. So the order of those nitrogen bases determines the informational part of the DNA. And remember, just because it's not written down does not mean it's not important. Okay, so that sequence that you find the nitrogen bases in, that is what um, dictates which proteins the cell is going to make. And our final characteristic of life here is that the body or the organism needs to be able to maintain homeostasis. Okay, and most of you think of homeostasis as a balance. Okay, when we're talking about homeostasis, we're talking about a constant steady internal environment. Temperature is not the only thing that needs to maintain homeostasis. Okay? Um, our focus is going to be more on a nice steady balance of water, nutrients, and energy. Okay? So there's energy balance, organisms that are um, eukaryotic like plants, animal cells, they're going to use mitochondria to help with our energy balance. These would be things like why we eat, a, um, the use of energy, okay, um, nutrient balance, making sure we have the right um, intake of nutrients, uh, we're able to digest those nutrients, and how we store the excess nutrients. If there's too much sugar in the blood and our body pulls it out of the blood and we store it as fat, all of those help with the balance portion, as well as the balance of water. Okay, um, we balance water by drinking and eating and then urinating. So all of those help us maintain homeostasis, a constant internal level of energy, nutrients, and water. Okay, so now that we've established the characteristics of living things, let's talk for a second about what's called cell theory. Okay, um, cell theory revolves around that all things are made up of cells. So that's the first component of our cell theory. All living things are made up of cells. Because if you remember, cells are, are the smallest unit of living things. The portions of a cell, the parts of a cell, are not living on their own. The second part of cell theory states that cells are the basic unit of structure and function in an organism. Again, if they're the smallest unit of living things, then they would be the basic building block of each organism. And the last part of our cell theory states that new cells are produced from existing cells. Cells don't just come out of thin air. The living, currently living cell has to reproduce, which again was a characteristic of life, to um, have new cells. Okay, most of you remember from middle school how cells are able to organize themselves. Remember an individual is just one cell. A group of cells that work together is a tissue, so they're gonna have similar functions. A group of tissues that works together, they're an organ. Okay, and a group of organs that work together, that gives you your organ system. And then your group of organs that work together, for instance. Um, so there's our digestive system here. So our groups of systems that work together, so digestive with respiratory, circulatory, is going to result in the organism. And everything does not have to go all the way to the top of the hierarchy. You know, we've got um, bacterial cells that don't obviously don't go past the cellular level of organization because they're just unicellular organisms. Um, we've got uh, fungus whose uh, cells are not grouped into more than tissues or maybe organs, so they're not going to go through organ systems until they get to the organism. Okay, um, but animals and most of your plants are going to go through all of these cell organizational levels. Uh, cells also have the ability to differentiate or to uh, specialize. Okay, um, you'll see both of those things, uh, specialization or differentiation. I'm going to run out of room. And so you can see in these pictures here, 
got a variety of different types of cells. They're all going to have those same basic characteristics of living things, okay? but these cells have specialized so they can do different kinds of tasks. Uh, for instance, over here, we have a muscle cell. So it's, you'll notice they'll be very long. They have these stripes or striations in them. That's what allows them to contract to help you move. What we have here is what's called stomata. These are on plant cell. These are on plants. Okay, there's the cell right there. The stomata is actually the hole in the middle. But those regulate how water goes in and out of a plant. Um, over here, we have hemoglobin. Um, some of you may know that hemoglobin is what transfers the oxygen in your body. So these cells are bit, built to be able to attach to the oxygen and fit through your uh, capillaries. And then over here we have a nerve cell, which is made to do electrical um, message conduction uh, to be able to send the messages throughout your body. So these are all just different kinds of cells that have specialized in a multicellular organism. You have to have the cells specialized to be able to do different jobs. Okay, so we're going to look at the two types, of the two basic types of cells, prokaryotic versus eukaryotic, and then the parts of a cell, and we'll be all set for today. Okay, so we've got two basic types of cells, a prokaryotic cell versus a eukaryotic cell. We're going to make a little table here of information. Okay, and so we're going to just kind of go through and compare these two to one another. Okay, so let's start with the fact of Let's start with whether they have membrane-bound organelles or not. Membrane-bound organelles are things like a nucleus, a Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, chloroplast. Okay, so a prokaryotic cell does not have membrane-bound organelles, and a eukaryotic cell does. This is our number one biggest difference between the two. This is what we're looking for. Just because a prokaryotic cell does not have membrane-bound organelles, does not mean it can't do the functions. It still has DNA, it can still do metabolism, it just doesn't have it compartmentalized like a eukaryotic cell. It's a much simpler cell. Okay, so prokaryotic cells, no membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic cells are like you, and you have membrane-bound organelles. Your cells have a nucleus, they have mitochondria. So eukaryotic is like you, so it's going to have membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotics are going to be smaller than a eukaryotic cell. Okay, um, they are, they're both types of cells, so they're both going to be small, but a prokaryotic is going to be smaller than a eukaryotic cell. They are both going to have ribosomes, which should tell you then that a ribosome is not a membrane-bound organelle. Both kinds of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic, have ribosomes. Prokaryotic cells do not have membrane-bound organelles. So if they have ribosomes, they can ribosomes then cannot be a membrane-bound organelle. Prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells have ribosomes. Ribosomes are extremely important because they make proteins. And as you'll learn as we go through more and more material, that proteins are the end-all be-all. It's all about what proteins you make. Okay, so the next one says, do they have genetic material? Basically, do they have some DNA? Yes, they do. Okay, it's just whether it's in a nucleus or not. In a eukaryotic cell, like you, that genetic material is in a nucleus. In a prokaryotic cell, they have genetic material, but it is not enclosed in a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells um, developed first, so they are older. We're talking billions of years old. And about three and a half billions uh, of years ago, they, um, they evolved. Eukaryotic cells, they're going to be slightly younger, but we're still in the billions here. About 1.5 billion years ago, eukaryotic cells started forming. And our kingdoms that you will see these different kinds of cells in, prokaryotic cells are bacteria only. We have two kinds of bacterial kingdoms, the RK bacteria and what is called the U bacteria. And so both of those contain prokaryotic cells, and eukaryotic cells are in the rest. They're in what's called protist, uh, the fungus kingdom, as well as plants and animals. Those are all eukaryotic cells. Okay, so those are the two basic types of cells, prokaryotic versus a eukaryotic. 
Now we're going to look at some characteristics that are in every kind of cell. So all cells are going to have these. Prokaryotic or eukaryotic, it does not matter. All cells, prokaryotic and the eukaryotic ones, are going to have these four features. Okay, um, so the first one is going to be a cell membrane. They're all going to have a cell membrane. And you can see that here on this prokaryotic cell. You can see it here on this eukaryotic cell, which is a plant cell. You can see it here on this eukaryotic animal cell. And you can see it here on this prokaryotic cell there. So all cells, no matter what kind they are, they're going to have a cell membrane. Okay, they are all also going to have cytoplasm. Where cytoplasm is that like jelly-like stuff that kind of fills the middle of the cell. So they're all, no matter what kind of cell it is, they're all going to have some cytoplasm. They are also going to all have ribosomes. If you remember from a few minutes ago, ribosomes make proteins, and all cells have to be able to make proteins. So these little tiny dots in all of these cells, okay, these are ribosomes. And all cells are going to have ribosomes, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic. And all cells, also again, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic, are going to have that genetic material. It doesn't have to be in a nucleus to still be DNA. You can see it in this prokaryotic cell there. There's our DNA. It's not enclosed in a nucleus. There's the nucleus of our eukaryotic cell there. Okay, so these four things are in all kinds of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Okay, so these are both examples of prokaryotic cells. So they are both different types of bacteria. So they are prokaryotes or a prokaryotic cell. That's an R. Okay, and so remember they're going to have to have a cell membrane. Okay, so they've got to have a cell membrane because all cells have a cell membrane. They've got to have cytoplasm. They've got to have ribosomes. Okay, so the plasma membrane is your cell membrane there, the cytoplasm, the ribosomes, and they're going to have DNA. You can see it here. Okay, some things that um, prokaryotic cells, since they're significantly uh, simpler than a eukaryotic cell because they don't have all those membrane-bound organelles, um, lots of them have a cell wall. Not all of them. There are some that do not, but many of them will have a cell wall for protection, and a lot of them will also have flagellum. A um, flagellum or uh, flagella is the plural. These tails that are important for mobility. Okay, remember they help us. Uh, they help the cell to be able to move from one place to another. Okay. Your eukaryotic cells, they're going to have a lot more um, parts to them because they have all these membrane-bound organelles. Okay, so here we have a eukaryotic cell, and we're going to review all the parts of a eukaryotic cell. So you can see your eukaryotic cell over here. Hopefully you recognize this as an animal cell and not a plant cell because it does not have a cell wall, it does not have a central vacuole, it does not have any chloroplast. Um, but both animal cells and plant cells are examples of eukaryotic cells. Okay, so let's look at some parts of the eukaryotic cell. Okay, so the first one we have here, we're going to look at the nucleus. Okay, and so you can see the nucleus here in the middle. Okay, that's our nucleus. Okay, and so the nucleus, there's a zoomed in version of it over there on the left. The nucleus is where you're going to find the DNA. Okay, so the nucleus is going to hold the DNA, holds the genetic material. And nucleus, you're going to find a nucleus in all eukaryotic cells. It doesn't matter if it's a plant, it doesn't matter if it's an animal, it doesn't matter if it's a fungus, it doesn't matter if it's a protist. All eukaryotic cells are going to have a nucleus. All eukaryotic cells are also going to have a mitochondria. The mitochondria is this one here that looks like a bean. Okay, you can see it in your um, big cell here. They're these kind of yellow-looking ones. Those are mitochondria. They are in all kinds of eukaryotic cells. Plant cells have a mitochondria. Okay, plant cells' job is to produce ATP from food. 
So it doesn't matter where the food came from. It doesn't matter if the organism made the food like a plant does or if the organism had to ingest the food like an animal does. But the mitochondria is going to take that food and make it into ATP. So the mitochondria is in all kinds of eukaryotic cells. The third one that we're looking at over here on the side is a vesicle or a vacuole. Okay, there you can see them here in your little eukaryotic cell. Okay, you can see um, some of them coming off of the Golgi apparatus there. Um, your big difference between a vesicle versus a vacuole is going to be size. Okay, a vacuole is a little bit larger and a vesicle is a little bit smaller. Okay, um, all these really do is they're storage organelles. Okay, so they're going to um, help offer storage for uh, maybe the cell produces something that needs to be excreted from the cell, or maybe the cell has taken something in. Okay, but you can see they're just little storage, um, basically little storage sacs, with a vesicle being a little bit smaller than a vacuole. And we're going to talk about the particular vacuole that you find in plant cells in just a minute. But all kinds of eukaryotic cells are going to have some form of vesicle or vacuoles in them. Okay, so here we have another um, example of a different kind of eukaryotic cell over here on the side. This one is a plant cell, but you can see that it's got its membrane-bound organelles. Okay, um, just showing, this is just showing you another example of a picture of a eukaryotic cell. Okay, um, as we look at this, we're going to look at um, two more organelles first. Okay, we're going to look at our endoplasmic reticulum versus a Golgi apparatus. Um, you can see the Golgi apparatus on the plant cell there and the endoplasmic reticulum here, okay, right there coming off the nucleus. The easiest way when you're looking at a picture to tell the difference between endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus is that the endoplasmic reticulum is going to be closer to the nucleus. So all of your eukaryotic cells, whether they're plant or animal or fungus or protist, are going to have a Golgi complex or apparatus. The Golgi complex or apparatus is um, a packaging place, okay? It packages um, things that are going to be uh, secreted from the cell. So uh, maybe you're talking about your own body and you're talking about um, some cells that produce hormones. The Golgi uh, apparatus or complex would help package those hormones up so they can be secreted out of the cell. Uh, plants have a Golgi apparatus or complex as well. Uh, we also have an endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum, there are two kinds. There's what's called the rough ER, and the rough ER has ribosomes attached to it. That's what gives it the rough appearance. And it's going to help finish with protein synthesis. It's going to finish uh, folding the protein and allow for transport of things throughout the cell. Okay, so it allows for transport throughout the cell and will finish folding the proteins. And you'll find out very quickly how important um, protein shape is to its function. Okay, you also have, oh, I want those to be separate. Okay, so you also have uh, what's called a smooth ER. And so a smooth ER is going to have no ribosomes associated with it. That will give it its smooth appearance. And the smooth ER is going to be important for uh, lipid or fat synthesis. Okay, so it's going to help produce lipids or fats. And it's going to also help with detox, okay, breaking down poisons, toxins, detoxification within the cell. And something else that's here, that picture that's in the center that I can't couldn't get away real quick. I wanted to bring that by itself. That's our cytoskeleton. Okay, and a cytoskeleton you're going to find in most of your eukaryotic cells. A cytoskeleton is going to do exactly what the skeleton of your body does, except for the cell. It's going to help support the cell and sometimes will also allow for transport and occasionally allow the cell to move um, in, in small areas. Okay, so we're going to wrap up with a few more structures, and these structures are going to be more plant and animal cell specific. Plant cells and animal cells, again, are still both eukaryotic cells, but these are the ways that once you've narrowed down that it's a eukaryotic cell, that you can help determine whether it's a plant or an animal cell. Okay, so animal cells are going to have what are called lysosomes. 
lysosomes are not going to be very distinguishing because lysosomes look like, hopefully these look similar to you, to the vas um, vesicles and vacuoles that you've already seen. So they're not very distinguishing characteristics. It's easier to take a look at your plant cell and determine um, its distinguishing characteristics. Before we go there real quick, let's talk about what a lysosome does. A lysosome is going to uh, digest materials. Things that have come into the cell that need to be broken down, the lysosome will do that. Okay, the plant cell is going to have these chloroplasts. Okay, um, chloroplasts are not going to be found in an animal cell because a chloroplast has the ability to do photosynthesis, and we don't need that ability. Okay, so chloroplasts are a membrane-bound organelle that are specific to plant cells only. Uh, plant cells versus an animal cell will also have a cell wall okay, on the outside there. That cell wall is for protection and support. The cell wall and the cell membrane are two different things. If a cell has a cell wall, it still has a cell membrane. We'll take a second, um, and the last thing we'll do is talk about what the cell membrane does and the ribosome that all of our cells have. Okay, so the cell wall offers protection and support. Animal cells do not have that rigid cell wall. Plant cells are also going to have a particular vacuole called a central vacuole. All um, vacuoles and vesicles, remember their storage capacities here, okay, and so all of them have the ability to store things. The plant has the central vacuole, though, which is very large. It helps store water. Um, it's one of the things that um, determines its the amount of water that's in there determines whether the plant is wilty or standing up straight. Okay, but that is a characteristic of plant cells specifically, that large central vacuole. And our last two things we've mentioned, but they are, uh, we didn't, we mentioned um, that they have them, but we didn't talk about what they do really, and that's, you know, pretty important. And so what we have here is a cell or a plasma membrane. And remember, these are on all kinds of cells. It doesn't matter if it's a prokaryote or a eukaryote, you're going to find this cell or plasma membrane. And the cell membrane has a really important job. Okay? The job of the cell membrane is to regulate what goes in and out. Okay? And so it, if it cannot regulate uh, what goes in and out, then the cell will die. Okay? And so that is uh, the cell membrane's job. Only certain molecules are able to get across it. We'll talk much more in depth about its structure and how it regulates things. But if that cell membrane has any kind of hole or tear in it, then the cell will not survive. Uh, the other organelle is the ribosome here. Okay, the ribosome is the green part of this weird-looking hat-looking thing. It's just the green part, so all of this. Okay, the ribosome, again, is found in prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. And its job, I think we mentioned this on one of the other slides, is to make proteins. And proteins determine the chemical reactions, they determine the kind of cell, they determine how the cell works with other cells. They are critical for the cell survival. So all kinds of cells have those. So it'll be very important. Um, the main things you're going to need to get from this are going to be your differences between a prokaryotic versus a eukaryotic cell. You're going to have to be able to recognize those um, two from diagrams and pictures, as well as um, all these different kinds of organelles, what they do, and you'll also need to be able to recognize those from pictures. And we'll work with more of that stuff in class.